Warsaw and Budapest and Moscow and Vladivostok. It is that process, the working out of the conflict between forces and relations of production that has borne in upon those states themselves that one of them has got to go. And that is, you might think of being paradoxical or awry, but that is a vindication of the materialist conception of history. I can see I'm about to get past a note. And I won't, I won't, uh, I won't um, detain you any longer than to say that though capitalism has had a longer lease of life than some of us would have predicted, or that many of our ancestors in the socialist movement did predict or allow, it still, and it still produces the fax machine and the microchip and is still able to lower its cost and still able to flatten its distribution curve very well, its central contradiction remains the same. It produces publicly, it produces socially. It conscripts and it mobilizes and educates whole new workforces of people. It has an enormous transforming, liberating effect in that respect, but it appropriates privately. The resources and the natural abilities are held in common. The earth belongs to us all. You can't buy your child a, a place at a school with better ozone. You can't, you can't pretend that the world is other than what it is, which is one and human and natural and in common. But capitalism must do that because it must make us all work until the point when the social product is to be shared, when suddenly the appropriation is private and suddenly Donald Trump outvotes any congressman you can name and anyone with a vote because of the ownership of capital. And it's that effect, that annexation of what we all do and must do, the influence of labor and intelligence and creativity on nature, um, the same air, the same water that we must breathe and drink, that, that means that we may not have long in which to make this critique of the system sing again and relevant again and incisive again. And in doing that, I'm afraid, I'll have to quarrel with Dinesh D'Souza that we already live in more or less the best of all possible worlds. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hitchens. Now, we're going to, uh, we still are going to have uh, the two panelists uh, have concluding remarks and uh, perhaps ask each other a question. But uh, we're going to turn things around a little bit and we're going to have a question and answer period now. Uh, why do we do this? Uh, because we're fun guys. Uh, no, because we think it's good to have a, a chance for the audience to ask these questions before uh, our two distinguished panelists can answer them all themselves. So, if you have questions, please come to the center aisle behind the microphone and line up. You don't have to come individually. Just come right around and just speak right into the microphone. And uh, please tell us your name and uh, who you're directing your question to. Thank you. uh, my name is Dennis Perrin and it's directed to Mr. D'Souza. Uh, I work with a media watch group in New York called FAIR. And uh, our main critique of the media, you were talking about the media in India and how the government sort of controls what can be said and what can be printed at some point, uh, given a certain umbrella of freedom. Um, our critique of the American media is much your critique of the Indian media, in that in 1983 there were 50 corporations owning major communication outlets. Now there are 23. Uh, we, we oppose the centralization of information and the commodification of news in this country where you get to the point where the NBC president, Richard Wright, can say we can do without a nightly news. Uh, this is what we fight and this is what we see under the Reagan years and even more so under the Bush years given uh, Time Warner and now Sony Columbia. Uh, we see a constant uh, narrowing of information and a lack of true public participation in mass communication in this country. You can hand out a mimeograph sheet in Times Square but you cannot use NBC on their level to communicate. Um, I just want to say to you, or I want to ask you, how you see this uh, to be resolved, and do you feel that, as we do, decentralization, uh, as we've asked NBC, sort of in a sarcastic way, to uh, divest themselves of NBC, um, do you feel that would be better for democracy because we at FAIR feel that a decentralization of corporate control of mass communication 
would be beneficial for democracy. Do you feel the same way? I don't think I have any <clears throat> quarrel with that premise. I, um, my only disagreement would be with some of the specific critiques that I think uh, you launched. Uh, by that I mean that um, if one took an inventory of major stations as well as, let's say, major newspapers, um, and look to see, for example, during the last uh, five Republican and Democratic presidential elections, whom did they endorse? I think one begins to see a somewhat disturbing homogeneity of preference for the Democratic candidate. Uh, to me, uh, I don't know if that's because um, Gannett owns Sony or the Japanese are buying into our markets. I haven't uh, examined um, it in that much detail. I do think that there is a kind of ideological homogeneity in the media uh, that is the product of, of a kind of oligopoly. I mean, we have three major networks, and I think the infusion of cable, for example, is uh, providing healthy competition. Uh, I'd like to see uh, more local newspapers gain prominence, more local stations um, uh, represent a greater ideological diversity and pluralism of views. Well, I think the fact that every major newspaper in the country, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, the LA Times, the San Francisco Examiner, I mean, it is a bit of a coincidence to have all those major newspapers come out, let's say, for Mondale over Reagan. Um, we have a kind of editorial homogeneity of views on the major newspapers. Now, there's more diversity at the local level. But I think if you follow the media, you know that there is a strong tendency on the part of local media to, to imitate, to ape uh, what the big guys are doing. Uh, and so I think that there is a, uh, I think that, that that creates some disturbing tendencies. I'm not sure it's relevant to precisely the debate between capitalism and socialism, especially on the issue of the networks, because remember that the, the airwaves are defined as a public good, which the government, in a sense, rations out between um, uh, people who apply. For example, the, you can't just start up your own radio station. You have to apply for a license, and these licenses are very difficult to get, and there's a lot of um, patronage and so on that comes into it. In other words, the government is an actor. We are not dealing with an entirely private sphere. Uh, so the, the communications media, especially the visual media, are in the murky in between, between government ownership and private control. So I don't find them particularly illuminating uh, on this topic. Well, no, it's not, uh, I'm sorry. We're going to limit it to one, one follow-up question. Yes, ma'am. My name is Jennifer Ellingston. Uh, my remarks are addressed to Mr. D'Souza, but I would like uh, Mr. Hitchens to repudiate or vindicate me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I felt Mr. D'Souza's remarks were uh, about capitalism were simplistic, uh, trite, um, puerile, and frankly false. Um, I'm wondering how. Please I tell us how you feel. Don't hold that. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'm wondering uh, how he found competition a more basic principle in human nature than cooperation. I'm wondering how he finds that production for profit comes first over production for use. Uh, I don't suppose that the first humanoid who picked up a bone to use it as a weapon or to scratch the earth or whatever was thinking he would set up shop and sell it for profit. He probably thought he would use it. That's the way uh, it tends to have happened pre-capitalism. Um, and uh, uh, finally, uh, if ownership of property, he did not distinguish between property for use and simply property. I'm allowed to have a bicycle or a house or whatever, but when I start renting out bicycles, it's property for use. Um, why all the producers in a, uh, of a product don't have an equal right of ownership in it under the principle that he defined? Um, well, I think I'll cut it there. I think... Uh the distinction that you made at the beginning between competition and cooperation uh, is under a free market system a false one. Uh, in the free market, one competes and cooperates at the same time. By that I mean, uh, if one wants to set up a shop, something that 
you find very distasteful. 